Hi, uh, my name is Miranda Vaughn. I am the program assistant here at Big House Books, and um, I just want to talk for a few minutes about who we are, what we do, and how you can help um, with an, our mission. Um, so first of all, if you're not familiar with us, we are a nonprofit organization located in Jackson, Mississippi. We are completely volunteer run and we send free books to um, incarcerated people in the state of Mississippi. Um, we were founded in December 2014 by a group of local teachers and nonprofit organizers who just saw that there was a need for this sort of thing. Um, they started collecting books out of the trunks of their cars. From there, I think they went to a closet. <clears throat> um, and now we actually have our own space, um, a small, uh, what we call our library um, in Midtown Jackson. Um, so we've, we've come a long way. We're climate controlled now, which is a huge deal. Um, and so, yeah, we work out of Jackson. We are the only books to prisons group in the state of Mississippi. So we're the only ones who do what we do. Um, and so we, we stay pretty busy. Um, we, uh, supply pretty much anything and everything as far as books and genres and things like that go, um, fiction, nonfiction, uh, we supply like dictionaries, thesauruses, planners, journals, composition notebooks, activity books like Sudoku and, um, word searches. We do coloring books, um, pretty much anything except for magazines, um, and, uh, you know, anything obviously that's like explicit or whatever, obviously we can't send, but, um, we, the books that we collect are paperback only the facilities in our state only, only, um, accept paperback. Um, so that is one of the main stipulations. Um, we are written into the department of corrections, uh, policy as a book vendor. So they, we do have some credibility there and, um, legally, the facilities that are under MDOC's jurisdiction have to accept books from us as long as, obviously, it meets the prison's guidelines and everything. So that's been really helpful um, because I know a, a lot of books to prisons groups in other states have a lot of issues with getting books uh, refused and sent back and all that because they don't have really any legal standing with their Department of Corrections. And so we are fortunate to have that. So we have a little bit of backup if there's any confusion with um, mailing and, and returns and things like that. Um, this chart is just to kind of show you what the makeup of correctional facilities in the state look like. I believe this is maybe two or three years old. So I'm sure some of the numbers have changed a little, but you can kind of see the bulk of where people are housed. Um, obviously state prisons take up the most, more than half of um, incarcerated people in Mississippi are in state prisons. There are four state prisons um, across, the, uh, across Mississippi. And uh, Central Mississippi Correctional Facility, I believe, is the largest, and that's housed here in Pearl, just down the street from where we are. Um, and so <clears throat> we get a lot, a lot of requests from them. Um, local jails, juvenile detention facilities um, also write to us, work centers, things like that. Um, we do have a federal prison in Yazoo City, and we get uh, letters from them regularly as well. So um, you can see we have a lot of people to service and obviously every single person doesn't write to us, but we do seem to be uh, gaining momentum, especially after the pandemic. We've gotten more volunteers, we get, we're getting more letters um, and requests from inmates. So we're definitely growing. Just a few fast facts if you're not familiar with incarceration rates and things like that in the state of Mississippi. Um, we have a car an incarceration rate of 1,031 per 100,000 people, which is the highest worldwide. And these statistics are maybe two or three years old at most. So um, that's pretty much been consistent. Um, each year, at least 84,000 people are booked into local jails in Mississippi. We also have a high proportion of Hispanic 
um, incarcerated people in the Adams County Correctional Facility because that is one of the ICE holding facilities. Um, <clears throat> and an interesting statistic um, is while the U.S. prison population is 16% lower today than before the pandemic, Mississippi's prison population has increased while everybody else's has decreased. And of course, <clears throat> This, you know, it's not great for Mississippi <laughs> for a number of reasons, but also just getting down to the financial aspect of things, it costs taxpayers a ton of money to house these prisoners. And so <clears throat> what we do and our contribution is just a small way to make sure that incarcerated people have access to resources so that they can get out and hopefully not go back in. Some barriers for incarcerated people that you may or may not be aware of and something that we see regularly here. Um, first of all, a lot of the people who write to us are indigent, uh, meaning they don't have any family or friends or anything like that to provide resources to them. Um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of times they have to <laughs> barter to get, you know, the stamp to put on the letter to send to us, and that sort of thing. And so the mail that they get from us may be the only mail that they receive maybe the only things that they own for themselves. Um, so we try to keep that in mind and, and make sure that we send people as close to what they ask for as we possibly can so that we make it worth their while because a lot of them, it is a bit of a sacrifice for them to just write to us to request books. Um, they also have limited access to prison libraries. Um, a lot of facilities don't have prison libraries. And if they do, a lot of times the books are really outdated or the library may be housed in one wing or one building. And if you're not housed in that particular wing or building, then you're not allowed access to it. <clears throat> a lot of times the first punishment or privilege that is taken away, if there's some sort of punishment, is access to the library. Um, so uh, even if prisons do have libraries, they're not always accessible. They don't always provide what the inmates need. Um, so we're able to kind of come in and, and um, supplement a little bit. Um, there's also limited access to educational resources. Um, you know, some prisons offer GED classes and things like that. And some of the state prisons offer more, but like if you know, you're in a county jail or a city jail or something like that, you may not have access to classes or anything. So um, we also provide educational resources. Inmates are transferred to different facilities a lot. We get that a lot where we have people who write to us and have to say, you know, I've moved to this other facility and I don't have the access to the resources that I had at the previous facility that I was at. Um, and so we're able to provide those resources to them. And we also have to make sure that we keep up with the ones that are moving because they might write us a letter requesting books. And by the time we're able to fill that request, they may be moved to a different facility. So there's a lot of moving that goes on that we have to stay on top of. Um, there are educational barriers related to like understanding the law <laughs> and prisoner rights. Um, you know, I, even for an educated person, a lot of the like legal jargon is just kind of <laughs> over our heads. So, you know, you think about a lot of incarcerated people maybe only have a high school education or don't even have that. Um, a lot of them have reading levels that are elementary level. And so trying to understand like complex, you know, legal proceeding, procedural stuff. Um, can be really difficult, um, especially if you don't have, you know, a certain level of education. And so we try to provide as many legal resources as we can um, that will kind of help them if they need to um, represent themselves or if they need a better understanding of what it, what their rights are or what they're locked up for or whatever. Um, we um, are able to provide some of those to, to them as well. And also there is a lack of resources for returning citizens. So once they get out of prison, um, a lot of them are really just left on their own. And we provide a lot of resources in the forms of like trades and skills books or, you know, outdoor survival guide type things, um, CDL handbooks so that they can get their license to, to drive trucks. Um, things like that that might help them once they get out of prison because a lot of 
the incarcerated people that write to us will tell us, you know, I'm getting out and such and such, such and such date and I don't have anywhere to go. I'm going to be homeless for at least a little while. So they want to, they want guides on how to live off the land. Um, you know, it's difficult to get a job if you have a criminal record. So <laughs> um, being able to provide them with like, you know, basic information on plumbing and electrical work and things that they could kind of do freelance to make money. Um, but then you also have to think about, you know, even if they're able to find a job, they don't always have vehicles or transportation to get there. And especially in Mississippi, we don't really have public transportation that as an option. Um, so that's a barrier as well. Um, if they have, if they do have transportation, but they have a suspended driver's license because of whatever they had been put in for you know, that's a barrier. So the, there's a lot of things working against them once they get out of prison. And so we do also have a whole section of our library is resources for, you know, um, housing and, and um, jobs that are, are uh, companies that do hire people who've been in prison. Um, so we're able to provide those kind of resources as well. So basically how we work, um, we have a book quacking party is what we call our volunteer sessions. It's, I mean, it's, if there's enough people here, it does become a party sometimes. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's where we come and we pack books. It's every Sunday from 12 to 2. So we spend about two hours. Um, and typically on, on average, we can pack at least 50 packages of books during those two hours sometimes more if we have more volunteers. Um, but we usually have kind of an assembly line going. We have, you know, someone will actually read the letters because that's how it, it works. If I didn't mention it before, the incarcerated person will write us a letter requesting specific titles, genres, authors, subjects, whatever it may be. Um, and then we're limited to the books that have been donated to us because again, we're volunteer and supporter um, supported. So all of our books are donated. So a lot of times we don't have exactly what they ask for. So we just try to get as close as we can to what they ask for. Um, and every uh, person gets three books per month. Um, so we have to try to stay on top of that because a lot of times they'll write us let multiple letters throughout the month. And we have to kind of make sure that we're not... Um, sending them too many so, so that they won't get returned. Um, but typically we'll have a couple of volunteers read the letters and actually fill the requests, pick the books. You know, that's the real fun part. And then once that's done, we have a, an office where I'm actually sitting now <laughs> um, where they will go, uh, the, where the books will go and volunteers will log them into a books to prisons database that we actually share with other books to prisons groups across the nation. Um, and that's just where we create the invoice that goes inside the package that we're sending. And that's where we create the mailing slip that will go on the outside. Um, and we just simply go in, each inmate will have their own profile telling the location that they're at. And we'll just put in the, the titles of each book that they're receiving. And that will then create an invoice that we print out and send in the package just so that they know what's in there. Um, and so that's always good for our data entry volunteers <laughs> or volunteers who maybe can't stand for long periods of time so they can sit at a desk and, and input information. So we have jobs like that that kind of cater to different abilities and um, different interests. And then the last step is packing them, which is just, you know, straight up putting them into <laughs> the uh, bags to be mailed, weighing them, stamping them, and uh, putting them in USPS boxes so that one of our other volunteers can take them to the post office to be dropped off. Um, we also ask that any book donations that people drop want to drop off, if they'll do that during that that time, because that's really the only time during the week that we for sure have people at our facility since, again, volunteer run. Um, so if we have any new donations that come in, we'll have some volunteers go ahead and shelve them in their proper place in our library. So there's just jobs for anybody. There's jobs for, you know, we've had little kids four years old help out with stamping the inside of books <laughs> with our logo before we pack them. Um, <clears throat> the high school students help shelve the books, you know, the elderly 
people in wheelchairs, um, you know, just whatever the need may be or um, whatever abilities the volunteers may have or not have, um, we have jobs that will cater to pretty much all of that. So we try to be very inclusive when it comes to our volunteers. And here's just a few examples of some letters that we, we've received from people over the years. We get tons of just thank you so much for what you're doing. You know, this gives me something to do. This gives me something to occupy, uh, occupy my mind. A lot of them tell us, you know, the books that you, you sent are, have been so good for my mental health because otherwise I would just be laying in my bunk, <laughs> you know? Um, so, you know, what we give them is not just entertainment, but it's also, you know, a way to occupy their mind. It's a way to give them a sense of humanity. You know, they get to request books from us and we get to give them to the best of our ability what they ask for. And, for someone who doesn't get very much choice on a day-to-day -day basis, something as simple as just being able to choose something for yourself, um, what we give them that um, with allowing them to request books from us. And so that alone just makes them feel like they're not forgotten, makes them feel like they are humans. Uh, this letter is actually one of my favorites. We received it a couple of years ago and um, this person's essentially thanking us for our services during his time in while well, he was incarcerated, but he wanted to let us know that he wouldn't need our services anymore because he was about to get out and uh, go be with his family. So we love getting letters like this. And we do have volunteers who used our services while they were incarcerated. And then now they're out and they still volunteer with us. They still do fundraisers for us. They donate books to us. Um, you know, we go out, we try to go out a few times a year to different events and set up information tables. And we get to meet a lot of people that way. And we've had people come up to us and say, you know, I have a family member who is in prison and they use your services or that we've had some who they themselves were incarcerated and they stopped by our table and just wanted to thank us for what we did for them. And, and, um, you know, the, it let us know that what we're doing is good work and that it's life changing for the ones that are inside. So it's always good to hear those kinds of stories. Um, and here's an example of some artwork we receive. Um, usually a couple of times a week, we'll get artwork in the mail from some of the inmates and we will hang them in our, um, library here that's that's the extent of our decor um and so very talented uh folks that write to us and so we're always happy to showcase their artwork here in our facility um so as far as ways that you can help us if you're not in the jackson area and you can't come to a book packing party um you can always give us a monetary donation <laughs> we uh we try to tell people you know we love book drives we'll always accept your books but it we also have to keep in mind that we can have all the books packed and ready to send out but if we don't have postage to cover them they just sit here so postage is another aspect that we try to remind people like that we need that as much as we need the books because we have to be able to send these out in order to do what we do, right? Um, so we always tell people, you know, if you, you can go on our website and go to the donate page and you can sign up to be like a monthly donor and, um, you know, pick however much you want to spend, you want to donate every month or you can just do a one-time donation. You can also do fundraisers if you want to get, you know, a church group or a civic group or something together um, and do like a fun fundraiser and or a social media fundraiser and do it that way. Um, you know, any little bit helps. We tell people on average, we spend $5 per package on postage. So, you know, that's a real round number <laughs> that you can um, say, you know, I'll give you $20. I'll send four packages of books. So, Try to tell people if you can give monetary donations, please, please do because it does it helps so much. Um, but then also book drives and book donations. Um, we do ask, as I said before, that all books be paperback only. Um, that we do ask that they be in good condition, um, preferably no more than like 20 years old. Uh, we also keep an updated needs list on our website and on our social media. So definitely follow our social media and check out our website and we we do ask that if you're going to do a book drive that you try to be um mindful of what our current needs are because sometimes we don't really need like general fiction or romance you know but we may need like westerns 
or specific authors like James Patterson, Stephen King, those we get requests and we just can't keep them on the shelves. So um, we do ask that you keep in mind what our current needs are and try to focus on those needs more than just saying, bring us whatever books you have, if, if that makes sense. Um, you can also purchase our merchandise. We have t-shirts, hoodies. Uh, we recently got hoodies and they're very, very comfortable. Um, coffee mugs, canvas bags, and all of those you can purchase on our website. And the proceeds obviously go into our postage fund. Um, but then it's also a great way to market, especially if you don't live in, in uh, Jackson or uh, the surrounding area and you're not familiar with us. It's a great way to start a conversation with locals in your area about what is Big House Books and, you know, what can we do to help? So definitely check out our merch. Um, and then there's also remote volunteer opportunities, a lot of admin type stuff. If that's something that you're interested in, definitely reach out to me. Um, my contact information is here um, and I can let you know, you know, what our needs are as far as things that you can do remotely and I'll, I'll find something for you to do. Um, but again, this is all of our information. Definitely follow us on social media because that's the first place that we always update. Um, so if you're wanting to get the latest about what's going on and what our needs are, definitely follow us on socials. Um, and again, if you have any questions, reach out to me. I'm glad to answer your questions. I'm glad to help schedule a book packing party. If you would like to bring a group and do your own book packing party. Um, and we just, we're so appreciative of any help that we can get. Um, and I hope that this was uh, informative and thank you so much for your time.